the beginning of the sixth chapter, Jesus talks about three spiritual disciplines. He talks about almsgiving, giving of your alms. Don't do it to be recognized. Don't be ostentatious. He gives the discourse on prayer, and then he gives the discourse on fasting. Let's pick up the sixth chapter of Matthew, the fifth verse. Jesus says these words. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand in the synagogues and on the street corners in order that they may be seen of men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward. But when you pray, enter into your closet and shut the door. And pray to your Father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And do not heap up empty phrases like the Gentiles do. For for they think they will be heard for their many words. You must not be like them. For the father knows what you have need of even before you ask him. Pray then like this. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. For if you forgive men their transgression against you, so will your heavenly Father forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their transgressions, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you of your transgressions. And then in that sixth chapter, he goes on some other, to some other things. But those are the three aspects of spiritual discipline that we have in that first section of the sixth chapter of Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount. If um, there's two shining points, I believe, in the Scripture. If the Bible were represented as a a constellation of stars in the heavens, there are two, these would be two of the brightest stars. The 23rd Psalm and the Lord's Prayer. When we really concentrate on these texts in our hearts, it can really be a life-changing experience and change us for the positive. Many believers, and maybe you're included in that group, know that the 23rd Psalm and the Lord's Prayer has transformed their lives. And then for the next few Sundays, all the way up to Easter, we're going to be concentrating and looking at the Lord's Prayer and looking at the 23rd Psalm. These these two bright stars in this, this constellation of the Bible. Of course, there's other brighter stars in that constellation, but The Lord's Prayer and the 23rd Psalm are two bright stars in that that constellation. Understand this, saying the Lord's Prayer, we say it not as rote and not as a ritual. But when we say the the Lord's Prayer, we understand it as a a reality of the Christian experience. If we concentrate as a church family... If we were to concentrate for the next few weeks on the Lord's Prayer, all of us will be praying the same prayer. We will be focusing on the same scripture, and we all of us will be practicing a spiritual discipline. From now to Easter, this first Sunday in 2016 to Easter 2016, I challenge you as a congregation to really connect, really connect, with the Lord's Prayer, and with the 23rd Psalm as we make this journey together to Easter. I'll be preaching on it. Uh, Other pastors and other ministers in our congregation will be preaching on it. And we'll just be looking at the 23rd Psalm and the Lord's Prayer. But today we want to concentrate in, for the next few Sundays, concentrate on the Lord's Prayer, which you have repeated already in responsive reading, and then you heard the text out of Matthew 6 this morning. I want to look at three aspects of the Lord's Prayer to begin with today. 
First of all, the Lord's Prayer is a perfect prayer. I doubt if any one of us in here could improve on it. How many of you think you could really improve on the Lord's Prayer? Raise your hand. You know. It's a perfect prayer, an absolutely perfect prayer because it was prayed by the world's only perfect person. The only perfect person gave us, his disciples, a prayer. And it is a perfect prayer. Jewish rabbis usually gave their disciples a prayer to pray every day. Jesus was the perfect Jewish rabbi. So his words to his disciples were perfect. The Lord's Prayer is perfect in its pattern, it's perfect in its scope, and it is perfect in its focus. The Lord's Prayer is found in the Sermon on the Mount, which I quoted just a few moments ago. The Lord's Prayer is also found in Luke, the 11th chapter, in a different form. The disciples noticed that, that Jesus was pray, praying, and they saw him pray, no doubt, a lot, and... In Luke 11, they probably realized the, the deficiency of their own praying, and they asked Jesus to teach them to pray. We note the disciples did not ask Jesus to teach them to preach. The di disciples didn't ask Jesus to uh, teach them how to heal. The disciples didn't ask Jesus to teach them how to cast out demons. But the disciples asked Jesus how to pray. The, the Lord's Prayer is a disciple's prayer. Only a disciple of Jesus Christ can pray that prayer with many. The Lord's Prayer is perfect, I think, because of its order. Think about it. There are the first three petitions in the Lord's Prayer give God, and it gives to God and His glory. It deals with God. And with his glory. In the Lord's Prayer, at the very beginning, God is given his proper place. God will, God's will is paramount. A lot of times in our own particular praying, which so many times is imperfect, God is not given paramount and God is not given the proper place. Usually we are given the proper place. Oh God, help me. Oh God, give me this. Oh God, work on this. The prayer, the Lord's Prayer, is never an attempt to bend the will of God to our desires, but it is a prayer that attempts to submit our will to the will of God. The last three petitions, there's called a hinge petition in there, it's called in heaven as in earth. The last three petitions deal with our human need. They deal with the present, give us this day our daily bread. They deal with the past. Forgive us of our sins, and it deals with the future. Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from the evil one. The prayer is perfect because of that order. It's also perfect because of its focus. Think about it this morning. The Lord's Prayer is God-centered. Our Father who art in heaven. The prayer starts with the focus on the one that we love and adore. This is the most important focus in the entire prayer, centering on God. The Lord's Prayer is kingdom-centered. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. The kingdom of God was the central message of Jesus. When you look at the Gospels, the, the kingdom of God was the central message of Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God. He didn't say seek anything else first. Seek first the kingdom of God. Jesus' message was all about the kingdom, how to get in the kingdom, how to stay in the kingdom, and how to live in the kingdom forever. It is perfect because it is kingdom-centered. It, it is perfect because it is basic-centered. Give us this day our daily bread. The Lord's Prayer does not ask for wealth. We can't say the Lord's Prayer and say, God, give me money. The Lord's Prayer does not ask for health. We can't say the Lord's Prayer and say, Lord, heal me. The Lord's Prayer does not deal with status. It does not deal with power. It does not deal with knowledge. We cannot say the Lord's Prayer and say, God, give me a Mercedes Benz. It just talks about the basics. 
give us this day our daily bread. It just talks about what we need. It doesn't go into extravagances. Lord, I need a new suit. I need a new tie. I need a new pair of socks. It doesn't go into any of those needs. Just the basic needs. Bread. The people in Jesus' day lived day by day on the basics. They just had the basics. Food and water. Every day was a struggle to find food. And when Jesus prayed this prayer, give us this day our daily bread, it immediately resonated with these people because they knew that every day they needed their bread. It deals with the basics, and everything else is frivolous. It's a perfect prayer because it deals with forgiveness. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Jesus knew that our greatest need was to be forgiven. And to live a life of mercy and to show that mercy and that compassion to others. The Lord's prayer is perfect because it is, a, it is protection centered. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Jesus knew that we would be helpless and we could not go it alone. He knew our vulnerability. His prayer gives us a shield which turns harm away from us. So we realize that, that the Lord's Prayer then is a, is a perfect prayer. We cannot improve on it an iota. We cannot improve on it a bit. Not only is it a perfect prayer, but it is also a model prayer. When we look at the Lord's Prayer, we see the model for what prayer really is. Did Jesus mean for us to repeat the Lord's Prayer as our only prayer? I don't think so. Probably not. But he wanted us to see the Lord's Prayer as a model for all praying and to repeat it often. As we repeat it often, it keeps us within the parameters of what prayer is all about. The Lord's Prayer is a blueprint for all of our praying. It is not a rigid formula, yet it's appropriate to say these words because in them we unfold the entire message of the Bible. And the summary of our relationship to God. Anytime we pray, if we're not praying the Lord's Prayer, the Lord's Prayer should be a model of our praying. To put God first, to deal with the basics, the kingdom, to reach out to others. Our Father who art in heaven means to focus on what it means to talk about, to talk to the God of the universe. In all of our praying, we speak to the God of the universe. The Lord's Prayer talks about the priorities of God. Thy kingdom come. It talks about the purposes of God. Your will be done on earth. The provision of God. Give us this day our daily bread. The pardon of God. Forgive us of our sins. And uh, the protection of God. Lead us not into temptation. A model prayer. A model prayer that we should base all of our praying upon. When we pray, we receive the gift of God Himself. Prayer is communion with God. He wants us to know Him, and as we grow in prayer, we discover that prayer is more than simply asking God for things or a selfish means to an end. Prayer is not an attempt to force the hand of God. And you don't find that in the Lord's Prayer. Prayer is not an attempt to force the hand of God, but prayer is an act of submission to God. Understanding that God's answers are wiser than our prayers. When God says no, we realize that His no is wiser than our yeses. Prayer is to impress us with God more than to impress God with our needs. If we never gain anything from prayer, the one thing that we do gain is the opportunity to commune with God and to commune with Him as our Father. For, for, for many people, the Lord's Prayer is simply a prayer to recite. Um, we say the Lord's Prayer a lot of times. They say the Lord's Prayer a lot of times before football games and basketball games, and that's, that's okay. 
But a lot of times that is so much uh, rote to that. No meaning to that. You're praying the Lord's Prayer and you're ready to clobber the opposite team and you want to knock their helmets off. It's okay to pray the Lord's Prayer, I suppose, like that. But, but it loses its meaning when it's brought down into a lot of those elements of our life. It, it's not just simply a prayer just to recite by rote, but something that comes from the depths of our heart. We can find the Lord's Prayer to be a life-changing experience in our, in our life. There, there's no magic power in the prayer. There's no, uh, there's no uh, and mechanical re repetition Empty, meaningless, doesn't mean anything. anything. Jesus said in that text that I quoted this morning from uh, the sixth chapter of Matthew. Jesus says that the, the Pharisees thought that they would be heard for their, for their many phrases, for a lot of translation says for their babbling. They babble on and on. And, and they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Jesus says, don't be like them. Don't repeat all these vain repetitions you may need a new car and Jesus says in the in that Sermon on the Mount that he knows that even before you ask him so God knows our needs and when we recite that Lord's Prayer we understand that it is a prayer with understanding and we know that it can change our lives finally this morning the Lord's Prayer is a powerful prayer the Lord's Prayer ha has power to it when you think about it. Some people think of prayer a lot like a parachute. You know, it's good to have a parachute and you're glad it's there, but you really don't want to use it, you know? I've got a lot of hours flying and I've never strapped a parachute on. I did some parachute training one time, but in all of my flying, I never strapped a parachute on. Didn't, I, never, I never needed it, thank God. But if I ever needed it, I would sure be glad that it was there. And, and a lot of people see the Lord's Prayer like that. They see it just as a parachute to help them out whenever they need it. They go to the doctor's office. The doctor says, well, we see some spots on the x-ray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. They begin to see it as just a way to pray, a parachute to help them out in the situation. That doesn't have any power to it. Prayer is not a spare tire in our life. Prayer is the steering wheel. Those who don't, tr uh, don't pray are, are trusting in their own limited resources. Uh, the Lord's Prayer, when you really think about it, has unlimited power and unlimited resources. It is a powerful prayer. It is powerful, number one, because it brings into our lives God consciousness. Matthew Henry, the great Bible commentator, said, prayer is the key to the a.m. and the bolt for the p.m. When we live in a God conscious state, we begin to recognize the presence of God in our lives, and it opens up communication with God. You cannot pray the Lord's Prayer and not be fully aware of His presence and His nearness. When we truly say the Lord's Prayer and sincerely pray that prayer, it brings God into our everyday life and into our everyday experiences. It brings into our lives God consciousness. When we pray and say, Our Father we, are, uh, we, are, we realize that we are connecting to the infinite and it brings this consciousness into our life. We will be conscious of something in our lives. The Lord's Prayer brings God's consciousness into our being. God is not remote. God is not removed. God is here, our Father. That's God consciousness. If Brittany called me on my phone right now and said, my father, most wonderful, great preacher that ever lived, et cetera, et cetera. If my daughter were to call me right now, I would not be removed from her. I would not be remote from her. I would try to find out what she needed. 
if Adam were to call me right now and ask for money, which he does, I'd give it to him. I don't want to be, I don't want to be removed from Adam. Well, let me see. That's what he would say. I don't want to be removed from Adam. I don't, be, I don't want to be remote from him. Why? Because I am his father. The Lord's Prayer brings into our lives this God consciousness that we have a Father and that He is with us all the time. The Lord's Prayer is powerful because if we take it seriously, it can really change our lives. Someone said that it is the world's most dangerous prayer because it changes lives. The Lord's Prayer, someone said, is a risky prayer because it demands things upon our lives. John MacArthur wrote this about the Lord's Prayer, and I think it's really good. He says, I cannot say our if I'm living for myself. I cannot say father if I don't try to act like his child. I don't say who art in heaven if I'm laying up treasures on the earth. I cannot say, hallowed be thy name, if I'm not striving for holiness. I cannot say, thy kingdom come, if I am not doing my part to hasten the kingdom of God. I cannot say, thy will be done, unless I am obedient to his word. I cannot say, in earth as in heaven, if I am unwilling to serve him here and now. I cannot say, give us this day our daily bread, if if I am not relying on him to provide. I cannot say forgive us our debts and harbor a grudge against someone. I cannot say lead us not into temptation if I deliberately place myself in its path. I cannot say deliver us from the evil one if I haven't put on the whole armor of God. I cannot say thy kingdom come if I am not loyal to him as a king. I cannot attribute to him power If I fear what people may do, I cannot attribute to him glory if I am seeking honor only for myself. And I cannot say forever if my life is bounded completely by the things in time. The question is really this, what do we rely on for power as believers? If we reply on education, we get what education can do. If we reply on skill, we get what skill can do. If we, if we rely on technology, we, we get what technology gives us. If we rely on organization, we get what organization gives us. But if we rely on God, we get what God can give us. That's what this prayer has taught us. The Lord's Prayer is powerful also because of the one who taught us to pray it. According to his word, Jesus has all power, all authority in heaven and on earth. He is the most powerful. He is the omnipotent God. Therefore, His words are the most powerful. And His prayer is the most powerful. So as we begin to look at this Lord's Prayer throughout this month and part of next month, I want to challenge you as a congregation for this. I challenge you to say that prayer three times a day. Not as a ritual, not as rote, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Not as you're going through your daily activities, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom comes, thy will be done. Not that. I challenge you to say the Lord's Prayer during the day three times. One minute is all it would take you. But concentrate on that Lord's Prayer. Think about Him as your Father. Think about Him giving you your daily bread. Thinking about forgiving others as you are forgiven. Let's see what power it can do in our lives. And let's see what power it can do in the life of our congregation. Are you ready to accept that challenge? In the days ahead, we'll have more 
sermons on it, others will preach about it. But just as a challenge for this new year, think about saying that prayer, not wrote, not ritually, not in a ceremony, but from the heart. And let's see what it does in our lives. Amen. Let's stand for prayer. Father, we thank you that you are a God who loves us, who loves us.